afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ed Trends. I'm Gary Rivera Wilson, Director of Continuing Education and Professional Studies at the School of Education at the University of Albany. And today we are going to be talking about bringing teachers and students outdoors with the New York State Master Teacher Program. Um, also uh, co-facilitating with me today is Dr. Rory Glass, Regional Director for the Capital Region for the New York State Master Teacher Program, also with the School of Education. Hello, everybody, and thank you indeed for being here. I'm very excited today to be joined by two master teachers not from our region. Um, over the last several months, we've actually had the opportunity to expand um, our reach and invite master teachers and some of the programs that they're doing from across the state in to share with everybody. So today we have Stan and Nick with us, um, one from Western New York out around Buffalo and the other one from the Mohawk Valley, just slightly less to our west. Um, and North, and it's really great to have them with us. Dan and Stan and Nick, thank you both for being here and sharing your expertise with us. Um, we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. And I think we'll, we'll actually have Nick start us off here. And, uh, but thank you for having us for sure. This is a, a great opportunity for us. Here we go. All right. And uh, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and a great honor to be speaking to everyone today. Um, and uh, if at any point there is a delay in the slideshow or anything like that, just please let us know any technical difficulties and we'll do our best to try to fix it up. Um, but uh, as introduced, my name's Nick Dara. I'm from the central New York area. And uh, I currently teach mathematics here in Westmoreland, New York. Uh, it's a little close to Rome and Utica. Um, I live in Herkimer, so if you're familiar with that, Herkimer Diamonds and uh, the Thruway. Basically, I travel the Thruway a lot. Um, so the great New York State Thruway, if it wasn't for that, I would not be here um, teaching here. Um, so also a Freedom Rider teacher as, long as, as well as a New York State Master Teacher. Um, see there, there I am hiking a fi fire tower. Recently completed the fire tower challenge a couple of years ago with the, with the pup Zoe. There's Zoe pup, the light to have on the trails. And then uh, introduce Stan to you. So Stan, if you want to talk about yourself. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Stan Skynicki here from just outside Buffalo, New York, like Rory mentioned, um, where I currently teach at a school called Chicktawaga Central High School. I spent most of my um, academic career teaching in the middle school, but this past year uh, took a dive to the high school and really enjoying it and teaching some new classes, which is uh, pretty exciting. Um, I am part of the New York State Teacher Emeritus. I um, I guess graduated out uh, a year or so ago, but still have a fair amount of um, fair amount of work to doing with them still. And their professional learning teams are amazing, so it's uh, it's really nice to kind of stay in there. Um, and uh, and still lucky enough to do some of these talks and some of these hikes with our group. So they keep calling me back. I must something must be going right. I don't know, but. Uh, but yeah, thanks again for, for having us and uh, hopefully we can share something that everyone uh, can be useful and um, hopefully we can answer your questions as well towards the end. So Stan and I, uh, two different regions independently, uh, we're running a professional learning team uh, that dealt with bringing various groups to the outdoors uh, with the master teacher program. Um, I like to think of mine as kind of a light version. Stan is a little more, robust with his. Um, so it, it's a really good this presentation uh, is for a variety of different levels, whether you're just introducing the idea of bringing the outdoors to your classroom or to um, a big group of teachers, uh, or if you're ready, you baby stuff going out into the woods for a day and you want more adventure stuff, Stan will lead you through what that entails. Um, so as you can see in every walk in nature, one receives far more than he seeks. And that's really the philosophy that I go with uh, whenever I bring my students outdoors. And that's really the bulk of my presentation, what it take, means to take uh, a group of students just outdoors. Because I find even as a math teacher, it is very rewarding. And you get to see students in a whole different light when they're just able to get outdoors in whatever capacity that is. Um, so, what is an outdoor educational experience? Uh, for me, the way that I approach it is anytime you can take your students out of the traditional classroom 
and be able to explore or incorporate nature or as the title implies the outdoors into their lesson. Um, and that lesson can be very specific to content or even lessons on just um, stewardship and appreciation. Um, and it goes well beyond uh, STEM. Both Stan and I are master teachers through uh, STEM related fields, science and math, but it certainly could be in a whole variety of different fields as well. Uh, my girlfriend, she's an art teacher and she you know, brings her camera everywhere and certainly that can be incorporated um, into everything as well. Um, as well as teaching, I also run a bunch of organizations at my current school where I teach, uh, including student council, and I advise a bunch of classes. And I try to use the outdoors a lot with uh, those groups and do different outings with them uh, because I find it really beneficial in just building team uh, leadership skills and um, helping students open up. People on trails tend to, they tend to talk a lot more, or if they're contemplative on the trails after they're done, they, they tend to open up more than just sitting in a classroom, uh, I have found. So huge opportunities there um, that I have witnessed. Uh, in the picture here, you can actually see a group of my seniors uh, that my current year seniors that I took hiking in the Adirondacks. If anyone's familiar with the Old Forge area, we actually had an opportunity to hike Bald Mountain. Um, and uh, the vast majority of the senior class, I mean, pretty small school, like we're graduating 70 kids. So some of you I know are coming from schools that are much larger than that. Um, but with my class of nearly 70, um, for most field trips, we get around 50% participation, but for mountain hiking, we tend to get close to 100% of the class participating in it, which is really awesome to see. Um, and we had a whole bunch of different levels of kids and address that in just a few moments. By the way, as I'm presenting, if there are any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. If I don't address it right away, I promise I will get to it later on. So uh, it will. Um, and my approach has been a couple of different phases as far as incorporating things in. Um, one approach is just keeping things very local to what you can do in or around your school district. Um, there's different activities, including low ropes courses um, where there really isn't um, like the high ropes, like where there's a lot of danger involved, uh, but there is a whole lot of team building and confidence building with those types of activities. Uh, the pictures off to the side are from a class that we used to teach here called Freshman Seminar. Those are all my freshmen um, at a low ropes course that unfortunately isn't around anymore, but it was at one of our local colleges, SUNY Polytechnical Institute, uh, used to host us for a day. Uh, where we were able to go through a low ropes course activity and have people like guide us through uh, huge amounts of team building and um, leadership skill uh, seminars while we were there. Uh, but they were able to do it outdoors in very natural setting. Um, if there isn't a low ropes course area near you, certainly some of those activities could be recreated in a trail system near your school or if your campus has a green area or area off to the side, um, they certainly could be able to do that. And there's a whole host of resources online for being able to create those on your own. Um, so just Google searching low ropes course ideas. Um, some of them can be done in a gym, but again, going outdoors, I think something really affects the students there and they're able to um, take a little more out of it. And it makes it a little more special for the kids. You know, if you remember back to your days when you were in elementary school, middle school, even high school, any day that you could be able to go outside was like the highlight of the day. So trying to recreate that magic, even on a low, small scale, just by taking kids outdoors in their own backyard, literally, could work out really, really well. Um, some other activities that I've done recently, uh, right before spring break, I, um, through student council and another teacher that um, I work with here, organize a medallion hunt. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Onondaga County medallion hunt, uh, basically in the Syracuse area, the newspaper out that way, uh, members of their crew hide a very small medallion of roughly one and a half inches in diameter in some park or public space somewhere and clues are slowly released to the public every day. Um, and people, go out and try to find it because there's a $2,000 cash prize. Um, 
I was able to recreate that on a smaller scale here on campus where we posted clues where the medallion could be hidden. We had uh, one of our technology teachers actually create a Westmoreland medallion uh, using one of our 3D printers. And um, we pretty much uh, had the kids coming to a bulletin board, checking out clues every day um, until the medallion was found. Um, and it took, we had a limit on the number of days and on the fifth day it was found with one hour left in competition. And uh, although we couldn't give a $2,000 grand prize, uh, we were able to get a monetary donation from student council tax prize. But being able to see the kids come together, uh, wait outside the bulletin board, wait for me or the teacher I work with to post a new clue, um, all related to the outdoors or uh, our school campus was really amazing. And after school, seeing the kids run around outside, uh, working together, not just staring at their phone, uh, not just going home and, um, you know, it, it, it was really a joy to see. And when we first planned it, we thought, well, maybe 10 kids would participate in it. The rest, you know, I work with high school kids. There's a lot of jaded kids out there. I don't know if any of you work in high school, but, you know, sometimes they're not too enthusiastic about things that you might find fun. Um, but this had really good participation. And again, it was just keeping things local. Um, I'm kind of looking fortunate here at Westmoreland, we have three schools all on the same campus. We have our high, junior, high, junior and senior high school, we have our elementary primary school, and we have what we call our upper elementary school. And it makes one big campus. So there's plenty of space to be able to do this type of thing. Um, but in a smaller setting, it certainly could be done too. Um, but it was really cool to see the kids just running around, um, demanding us to give them more clues or if they were on the right track. And uh, it was nice. It was very, very nice. Um, and then as a math teacher, sometimes things are always kind of a stretch or tied in at the end. Like, oh yeah, that could cover in math or math you can support, especially when you consider nature and lots of science happens in nature and science discussions happen in nature. But there's math there too, there's math. Um, so one thing that I do with my algebra students, I teach algebra one and pre-calculus, is I have a math uh, photo lesson where they actually have to go out into nature and take pictures of things that generate parabolas. And then they bring those back in and we graph them using Desmos and trace out the graphs using vertex form. So simple activities like that, where you are bringing the kids outside to be able to have that appreciation and open their eyes to a bigger world. I, I think that's huge for um, a lot of what's going on. And if I've done this right, Hopefully my screen is still being shared. Can you see my new presentation that's opened up called Quadratics Every Day? Awesome, getting a thumbs up. But this is just a presentation and I'll link this to you if there's any algebra teachers out there or if you know one that is interested in doing something similar to this. Um, it's basically find three pictures of things that are parabolas. One of them has to come from nature. And um, I do this in kind of mud season. So I haven't been adventurous enough to bring the kids outside for fear of being um, very, uh, basically screamed at by our cleaning department. Um, mud in the classrooms not appreciated all the time. So uh, this I have the kids do on their own and they can muddy up their own homes. But um, it's a nice quick introduction to again, get the kids outside and get them motivated to see more than what they might be used to. All right, and there we have the pictures of the actual medallion um, and then our bulletin board of clues every day. Um, so it was a good lot of fun. And then some kids uh, as they're searching around the campus grounds. Uh, the one girl on the far right really got into it. Muddy day, decided to put on some mud war paint after her frantic search. So it was all fun. Um, and you can keep things local like I have there, or you can, as I say, have a bit of a stretch of the legs. So go on a bit of a more of an adventure. Uh, the pictures here are from my classes doing just that. Um, the mountain hike was from my seniors most recently. And then I also was able to take students snowshoeing and uh, cross country skiing. In the past, um, this past year, we did snowshoeing with the seniors and cross country skiing with um, ninth graders a few years ago. Um, and that was all facilitated uh, by an outdoor education facility called um, the Black River Outdoor Educational Facility out near Boonville, New York. 
So right on the southern tip of the Adirondack Park, uh, right north of Utica. And um, there's more than just that facility out there, but the, this particular facility, the Black River Outdoor Education Facility, uh, provides snowshoes, skis um, in the wintertime. They provide bikes and kayaks in the spring and summertime uh, for all educational groups for free. You just have to sign up. So there's places out there that if you're willing to do a little bit of homework and a little bit of uh, research, that if your campus doesn't have you know, a big area to be able to do this or your school doesn't have the equipment to be able to do things like this, there'll be, there's, there's places out there if you're able to get a bus um, to transport you. Um, and the link here, and we'll share the presentation as well. It's not shared already with you, but this goes right to the Black River Outdoor Education Program. So if you're local to the central New York area or even um, Mohawk Valley rather, or central New York area, they're very, very close to each other. Um, they're worth checking out. Um, like I said, you can't really eat free and they provide all the equipment um, and all it takes is just a phone call to make arrangements. And they do have a waiver form that you need to look through and make sure that your school does approve of it. Um, like most places that are outdoors and such programs, there are some clauses in there about injury. But from my um, use of these facilities, they have facilitators there that stress the importance of safety and staying on the trails in the case of snowshoeing and cross-country skiing. And uh, in the case of bike riding and just hiking, maintaining trails, maintaining contact with people, don't go wandering off, all that type of thing. And um, they'll speak to different outdoor um, things that are happening uh, locally or things that they've experienced as well. On the past snowshoe trip, one of the facilitators actually spoke about how she was in an avalanche and how she was able to be rescued and how she actually had to rescue someone else uh, using the beacon system uh, that she had and she demonstrated how that all worked. And for my seniors to settle down enough to pay attention to someone like that was really something. So it was, it was good to see. So those places are out there. And again, just might take a little bit of research if you are looking to bring kids there. Um, and I clicked the wrong button. So I apologize while I try to get my screen back up here. There we go. All right, um, state parks also just a great opportunity. New York State has some of the best uh, state park system. And if you're joining us from someplace outside of New York State, um, I, I'm sure your states do as well. And they're literally right around the corner from most places in New York. And they're open and available. And again, take a little bit of legwork on a teacher's behalf if you're willing to take your kids there, but they are phenomenal places to be able to um, do as simple things like hiking or even uh, have guest speakers come in on those facilities. Now, in order to prepare your students on a low, uh, low budget, low risk uh, outdoor adventure, it's all about being prepared from uh, The Incredibles, if you're familiar with that fine Pixar film, you have Edna Mode saying, luck favors prepared, uh, stolen from Louis Pasteur. Um, again, organizing takes a bit of legwork, but once you get it down, usually you're good to go for many years to come. And it first starts, in my opinion, with having a conversation with your administration, uh, with your students, and seeing what they're willing to do and what ideas they have. Um, students are a great source of ideas, and especially running student government organizations like classes and student council, the ideas should be generated from the students. Um, but if you need to push them in the right direction or ask them, hey, would you like to do this? Um, be ready for follow-up questions and be able to follow through if they say yes, or if they say no, switch gears. If they don't want to go snowshoeing in the wintertime, would they prefer going hiking in the springtime? Um, so having alternative plans always go. Uh, calling ahead, checking availability. Uh, a lot of these places, like I said, I go to different facilities uh, that um, host students, making sure they're available. But also, if you are going to a state park, seeing what their day rates are, seeing if buses are allowed, seeing if they're closed for repairs for anything, or if you're uh, taking a kid's hiking up a mountain, like I did with Bald Mountain, making sure that things are in favorable conditions for bringing students that some may have never hiked a day in their life, um, making sure things 
aren't too muddy or dangerous. Um, weather as well, checking for all of that. Uh, then your school board might have you write a proposal and being ready for that type of paperwork. And again, that type of thing comes from speaking to administration and seeing what they require or what they would like to see in paper first before they go through an approval. And sometimes I have found it takes several different iterations of your approval uh, or your proposal. They might not like what you're saying in the first one, so you have to try again and again and again until they finally agree to say yes. But having it and going through that editing process, um, if you get it down for one trip, it becomes a lot of copying and pasting for others. Um, if you are looking for funding or you get turned down because your school just doesn't have the finances to be able to do certain things, um, in New York State, there are different grants and across the country, there are different grants, especially to go to state parks. Uh, the link that I have here is the Connect Kids to Parks grant, um, which I have not had to apply for this one. My school has been pretty generous with what they've allowed us to do, um, but there's money out there to provide transportation and to waive registration fees for going to parks uh, in New York State, as well as some other things that this grant would cover. I've known some teachers that have applied for this and it's, from what they have told me, it's a fairly simple process. And um, of the teachers that I've heard that have applied for this, very, very few get rejected. And if they are rejected, it's a minor change that you need to go through their application process. Um, so there is money out there if you're thinking too expensive. Um, there's this grant as well as others. Um, national organizations also provide grants. Um, I was just reading about one from National Geographic. Um, those national organizations are a little bit more competitive, but they're out there. And uh, if you're not applying, you're not really competing for it. So um, don't hesitate to do that. Um, as far as what you might need in your local school, chaperones, obviously, uh, making sure your chaperones are willing to go on the trip and have it's nice if they have medical background, at least first aid and um, first aid and uh, what's the one that goes with it? First aid and uh, CPR. CPR. There you go. Thank you. First aid and CPR training. That's 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 helpful. And if they don't have it, uh, if you're the one organizing, make sure that you have it so that God forbid there's something that happens, you are prepared. Um, and then arranging for the chaperones. For my personal school, there's just a simple bus request form that has to go through the principal and superintendent and then finally to the bus garage and uh, making sure that that's out with plenty of time uh, for them to make arrangements. My school's policy is at least two weeks. Um, so just know your school's policy if um, you are planning all of that. Then having a letter to your students and parents telling them what's going on and how to prepare for the trip and uh, just good practice in general and having a way to document and share photos and things like that afterwards. Um, my letter that I use for parents um, should be up on the screen. Let me get this a little different view here. That should be a little better. Um, it basically, this one was for the uh, hiking field trip that we did this past spring or this past fall. And it pretty much outlines where we're going how long we're going to be there, what's provided, what types of clothing are appropriate, um, and going through that. I have COVID safety measures in that one as well, because we were a lot more strict back in the fall, obviously. And um, just as a way to reach out for parents to get in contact with me, as well as students that aren't on campus. Uh, we have a number of students that do not attend our school on campus here because they attend a BOCES program making sure that if you do a class trip that they're welcome as well and talk with their teachers and administrations and other buildings so that they feel comfortable attending a trip if they want to. Um, so a lot does go into it, but like I said, once you have it down a few times, it's basically copy and paste. Um, and all these documents that I use, I'm willing to share. So um, you don't have to start from scratch if you are starting up a program or looking for somewhere or something to do. All right, so I think that concludes my section on kind of the low end, like what can you do? Just basically open up the doors, bring the kids outside, mm -hmm. but probably have paperwork first. Um, so Stan, um, Stan, did you want to take over and share your screen so you can control the presentation or do you want me to just 
advance it as we go. Just advance it, and I'll tell you when to when to go. Oh, you can just click click it once. Now it should go through. Okay. Well, good. Thank you, Nick. Um, and yeah, my portion of this uh, today's talk is just going to be focused on a little bit more on like bringing like the teachers outdoors and and how they can benefit from them or from a experience like that. <clears throat> so, you know, what are the benefits of creating a trip for educators only, uh, like a secluded trick like <clears throat> trip like that? But um, I guess uh, I can kind of go back to, you know, how these things started. It was at one of our professional learning teams. Uh, we have so many great professional learning teams in uh, the master teacher program and uh, just a bunch of educators, K-12 sitting around in all STEM disciplines, discussing the outdoors and how great it would be to like kind of share those field experiences with our colleagues and uh, and even just get some people out of their comfort zones and uh, and see how they react. And kind of started from that, put a proposal together and uh, to our, our um, Western New York leaders and uh, we got a couple on, on the way. So, and getting the right people involved. But the initial idea was to, uh, to build a workshop that shared practices and create ways to use the outdoors and relate them in real world applications that can be used in any of our classrooms, uh, K-12 and all disciplines. Um, what we walked out with the first one uh, was much more than that though and, and, and different than what we actually expected. And I think that was really great thing about it. To be honest, I didn't really know how well it was going to go uh, by leading a group of adults uh, in the interior of the high peaks with wildly varying abilities. Uh, but we were so excited to uh, share our passion with outdoors with the group. And we learned so much from the experience and so much about each other uh, throughout this entire thing. The event ended up turning into a workshop that promoted leadership skills that went beyond the classroom, uh, putting yourself in challenging situations emotionally and physically um, and knowing that you prevailed and persevered past even your own expectations was, was something that maybe we didn't account for. Well, we definitely didn't account for it and it was great. But with that came teamwork. In order for it to happen, um, the group really just naturally bonded together. And through our multi-day trip, uh, everyone experiences throughout there, it's, it's inevitable. Everyone's going to experience highs and lows. Uh, and the group just tends to rally around these, these types of issues. I guess I should say what kind of trips we were doing. Um, throughout here, you'll, you're gonna see a bunch of different um, pictures throughout here. Most of them are from the Adirondacks. And through the, our master teacher program in Western New York, we've been running a like a three-day workshop in the high peaks and uh, with the goal of getting some people up um, at least one of our 46 um, 4,000 foot peaks in the, in the Adirondacks. It's just an amazing and magical place. And, what a great way to kind of share that. But some of the other pictures throughout there are also from, uh, from other, some local spots and we'll, we'll talk throughout there. And there's some quotes in there and those are from like former um, participants of these. But so with that increase of promoting wellness uh, across school districts, even our, my school district today on every Wednesday, we have an hour of uh, professional development at the end of the day. Um, well, we have shortened periods and we kind of have that at the end of the day. And today's was wellness. Once a month, we do that. And I feel like it's, um, it's something that's happening, you know, more and more and trying to take care of the whole teacher and uh, well-timed events like these can absolutely just rejuvenate and re-energize uh, anybody's well-being. Um, the, the woods can be magical in that way. Uh, so even though something like that can be stressful at times and, and being outside your comfort zone, the sense of accomplishment that you might get from that just takes over and quickly you forget the, the struggles that you, you went through, or actually, or they just become really good stories. Um, but with that comes personal growth. And most everyone that signs up for something like a, a three-day trip in the interior of the Adirondacks is probably looking for a challenge already. And uh, living up to that challenge as growth itself. And it trans transfers to absolutely all aspects of life. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So, and even like besides like the, the pictures, like using pictures that you take from trips like this in class are, are, are really powerful. And um, they, using your own pictures that you are in, they, uh, they, they spark inquiry and, and discussion in class. If you just leave it up on your, your screen as kids walk in. I use them as like phenomenon uh, aligning with our new science standards. 
Um, and they have, you know, immediate benefits like that, but just having those pictures and discussions in class, uh, you know, it's you showing that, that you were there, uh, and then it helps you explain like these like geologic landforms or, or, or such, or if you're looking at parabolas in the, in the, in there, you can look at a picture and show where, what you might be looking for in that, uh, to kind of go in like Nick was saying. But showing that yourself were actually in there uh, and live this stuff kind of gives the students, I don't know, I'd like to hope that maybe a little bit more respect uh, for the extent of what uh, you will do for like the betterment of the class. Like I'm putting myself out on the limb. Well, not really sometimes, but uh, put yourself out on the limb there to, uh, to really make sure that these are, uh, you know, great lessons and whatnot. Can you hit it once, Nick? Um, so like anything and, and like putting a one together for students or for teachers, got to have a plan, right? And having a plan is really important. And I really liked how, how Nick talked about um, having his students involved in creating that plan. And, and we do the same. And uh, creating like those goals together, I think are, are really, really important. Um, because like the, but having a plan is important. And, and like having any plan, just like the weather. I mean, it can change in an absolute instant. So it's good to have plan B, plan C, D, E, you know, you know, down the line. And uh, um, we have this saying in Buffalo, I, I, I feel like it's the saying pretty much goes anywhere these days. But uh, if you don't like the weather, just wait 10 minutes, it'll surely change. And uh, this week has certainly been that kind of day. I mean, or kind of week, I think. <sighs> Kids came into school on Monday with sunburns from 80 degrees on set on Sunday, and uh, and today it was two and a half inches of snow in Buffalo. So, uh, and then by the weekend it'll be 60 again. So things change quickly, and you got to be able to react react to it. So being flexible and being patient and being realistic about these things uh, uh, really are are very important. So typically before we go on a, a trip like that, like uh, I'll typically send out some sort of Google form with questions about uh, participants or potential participants, like their hiking abilities, past hikes, awareness of the area we're going to. Um, we even usually try to do some sort of shakedown hike uh, and come up with, I don't wanna say a training program, but like a program that uh, kind of what they should be doing ahead of time to get ready for uh, you know maybe a potential 10 hour day in the mountains or something like that. Um, so it's good to, be ha to have that plan, but being flexible and being patient and what I mean by realistic is be a real, realistic about the goals that that were being set. Sometimes it's tough to remember that the trip is not really about like the leader, like bagging some new peaks or uh, pushing past their own limits, their own personal limits. A, a good leader will put all that aside and, and make sure that the, the group, the overall group is well taken care of and that everybody's having fun and learning at the same time. I think that's really important. Uh, you're going to see some videos in there as well. Uh, the videos, well, actually, I'll talk about that later. Can you hit it again, Nick, please? And thank you. Um, so again, starting small and starting local is is really important. Uh, number one, uh, cost efficiency is obviously there. We're in Buffalo, and we take teachers all the way out to the Adirondacks. Uh, I think we could just go for the grandeur of it, and uh, why not go for the, the you know the biggest area? But Everybody has somewhere close that has some some really amazing um, history behind it, and uh, and if it is close, you probably know it pretty well. So picking somewhere close, like local parks and national parks, uh, they're generally easily accessible. Uh, and trying to pick someone at first or some place at first that has like easy to moderate to terrain would uh, would probably be be pretty good. I typically when we were doing a some smaller group settings and like uh, just an afternoon or something, try to combine it with another event. I was usually combining them with our, our regional cohort meetings uh, and which is a huge benefit because everybody's already in one place at one time. So logistically it's easier to get people out there. Uh, these pictures here are from the Niagara Gorge. If, if, uh, if you've never been there, people often come to see Niagara Falls, but uh, hiking down in the gorge is, is really amazing. These, uh, these pictures are right, I'd say just, um, just below or upstream of the power authority. And uh, it's 
pretty dramatic walls uh, that are just absolutely rich in geologic history and history itself and uh, Native American history. We have a, a strong uh, Native American population in our area. Um, and it's it's close enough to those cohort meetings. It's challenging enough, um, but it's just amazing. And it's a, it's a good, again, shakedown hike for that people can use for comparison uh, for those that were interested in our like Adirondack hikes and stuff. And um, knowing something about the area, I've been there so many times, I fish down there a lot. So it's easy for me to run trips in that area. Thanks, Nick. I'm gonna hit it again. So um, going on on that, like by picking somewhere local and whatnot is, I'm saying become an expert. And I don't, I don't mean become like the absolute ultimate expert of the area, but but kind of, right? I mean, if you're the one who's going to be leading a trip in an area, uh, I mean, people are trusting you to um, to have the answers when they uh, they have questions about the trip and what, when are we doing this or what's our plan and this and that. So yeah, you should be an expert of the area. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, do your homework, know the history of the area. Uh, more importantly, know the area so well and know what to expect if there are any problems. I always try to recon the area entirely before I go there. If, uh, and especially if I'm gonna bring a group and if it's not a place I've been before. I usually also pick the Adirondack High Peaks because I've hiked all 46 high peaks and I've gone through all of them almost again. And uh, I just feel so comfortable there that I, I really know the place like the back of my hand and I've uh, been in there for 40 some years that, uh, you know, that place is good for me. But being prepared uh, on that same sense, like talking about uh, first aid and CPR training. My wife and I are national ski patrollers. That's why I have that picture up there. Um, so we're trained in outdoor emergency care. I'm not saying you have to be to that level, but taking a first class is, is really easy. Most of your insurances and schools will probably even pay for it. Um, they're wildly useful for any application. It's just good basic skills to have. Uh, and they have ones that are geared more for the outdoors. And all they do there is, right, is, uh, is use your surroundings for things like, um, splints or something if you need and have some kind of plan like know who you can call if uh, or if you're out of cell range how you're going to get somebody out of there that's what I mean by like that ex escape plan if, if so um, and uh, like the videos like I, I mentioned before if you if you can't get out there or uh, bring the field to your classroom uh, I often use these trips as well to to take some footage and grab some footage of different areas that we've been on and um, so if it is for school, like during the pandemic, I was creating a bunch of these and I was doing like labs uh, with them. But I also use them as like a promotional tool to gain interest for future, future trips. Um, so I put those out there so people can see them, showcase the work uh, and or just use for labs in class. But if you can't be the expert in the area, reach out to professionals in the area. Uh, almost every trip we've gone on, I've, I've called like the local DEC and uh talk to naturalists and they come and do a talk about something and and they're always so willing to do so and they're usually free um or for or if they can talk about their program a little bit they'll do it for free or something like that um, but i also look at local businesses like i i look at uh not necessarily for sponsorship but for help with gear uh we're bringing some never ever sometimes into areas like the high peaks and they're pretty rugged areas and um so hiking in the gorge is nothing like ha hiking in the Adirondacks. It's uh, it's quite a bit different. So we even have like meetings ahead of time at like a gear shop. Like we have one place locally called Gear for Adventure, locally uh, owned and operated, and they help people with like shoe selection, and they often give them a a, a little discount or something like that. But uh, they're great, and they're always willing to help, and they're super excited. We actually took uh, took one of them on one of our, our recent trips, and. Uh, and they had they have a lot of repeat uh, repeat business from them. It's kind of nice. Um, if you can hit it again, please, Nick. So, uh, and the overall focus is uh, my focus on these trips is focusing on having fun. I have a lot of fun when I'm there, but I understand that my comfort level might be different than others, and I always try to keep that in mind. And that's where it helps, like my personal growth for sure, like uh, uh, helping me 
uh, just like dealing in a classroom with uh, so many different abilities and social emotional uh, things. It's no different, you know, with adults and, and you're still the leader there. And even though you're, you're up here at the same level, but they're also looking to you for answers. Uh, but trying to keep it fun and uh, learning when you're not even realizing that you're actually learning, right? So the idea is to always share the love for the outdoors with uh, as many new people as possible. Um, but remembering that everybody's level of comfort could be different. You know, having that, having that agenda is super important, but being able to read the crowd is probably even more important, right? So, um, you know, see how everybody's doing, how, what's the exhaustion level on everybody's face or is there something like that. And so it's really good to have like planned stops along the way, uh, discuss geology or map skills. Uh, the bottom corner is a, um, the, the guy with the, well, with the blue, light blue t-shirt on with the lettering on the back, Tony Shabloski, he was a, uh, master teacher emeritus as, as well, but he was just an absolute expert on uh, the flora and the fauna in the area. And he was so awesome to have on our trip. And not only that, we stopped multiple times to fish in Johns Brook Creek there. And he would talk about like stream ecology and how to read a river and stuff like that. Uh, it's just, those were things I didn't expect even to begin with. And uh, he's worked with me since on those. And, and now he's one of my uh, best uh, fishing partners, but uh, it, it, you know, stuff like that, they learn a lot, but you're doing at the same time, just like in any classroom that, that works really well like that. But when you make those plan stops too, it gives the, gives the whole group to uh, catch their breath, uh, you know, refocus, uh, grab a snack and, and stuff like that. So it really just kind of brings everybody back. Hit it one more time, please, Nick. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so again, having those uh, conversations with your crew ahead of time, those Google Forms, uh, asking the basic questions about those groups' abilities can, can really lead to a lot of, well, it can help fix some potential problems before we get there. What we also try to do is have multiple level um, routes uh, planned for the group. So if you have wildly varying abilities, uh, it's good to have like if you know the group and you have strong people I usually try to bring someone with me uh, as well that can uh, be like the tail end of the group to make sure that they're kind of doing a sweep but I also have like an A a B and a C route um, a route might be only a two to four miles of moderate elevation changes uh, the next one might be the B route could be four to six miles with some higher elevation changes and a little bit more rugged terrain and then that the C route uh, or vice versa, it could be the, you know, eight to 12 hour hike of like just the high flyer group, right? And, uh, and try to get people to be realistic about where they should be. But that's where those shakedown hikes really come into play ahead of time to see, see how, how we're going to go. But that requires more people to help lead the small groups, but it's easier to move a small group anyway. So I always try to break, say you have a group of 12 people, uh, try to group them in groups of four anyways, because it's, it's a lot easier to move smaller groups than it is bigger groups. Um, and then, uh, but any of those like forms or conversations you have ahead of time, you just get a better sense of the type of group you're going to have, um, how often they hike, like their longest hike, uh, what specific areas, their types of gear they have, stuff like that. So as these things can be like absolutely high, highly rewarding uh, leading a, a trip like this, they can be really stressful at times too. But uh, establishing routines, keeping those groups small. Um, if possible, I try to have um, someone that isn't hiking getting dinner ready. Uh, there's nothing like having a 10 hour hike and a nice warm meal waiting for you uh, at camp after you've been eating dried fruit and nuts all day. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, and uh, you know, learning place takes place all day uh, and moves into the dinner conversations as we talk about how we're going to use these things in our prospective classrooms. Um, and again, uh, through, through it ends up being an exercise of knowing, <clears throat> pardon me, that you can overcome obstacles in any aspects of life, um, which again, carry anywhere. And when it's all said and done, uh, quickly send out some sort of feedback form because you always want to learn, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, so well, and how you can always improve and, and just, you know, keep that, uh, that growth mindset going and, and learn how to always improve and make your uh, make your trip better and better. We've had wild success. We have another one coming in June, and uh, 
uh, we have a wonderful group coming and a, only maybe one of them have been to the high peaks and hope to get up, get them up a few 4,000 footers and make some memories, I guess. So thank you very much. Yeah. It was awesome. Thank you both very much. Um, so as you guys can see now, we are open to questions. And while Stan was doing his presentation, I saw uh, someone wrote in the chat about sharing the algebra um, lesson that I did. And absolutely, I will close out the screen and post the link to that because it's open sharing for that. So look out for that in the chat in just a few moments. Hi, this is Michelle Welcher. I just have a quick question on um, when you take groups of students outside or if you go on a field trip, like I teach seventh grade. And so I'm trying to think like, is it manageable to t take all my 125 students? Like, have it, do you, or do you usually do it by just each individual class? Just curious. So for me, like I said, I'm, I'm in a pretty small school district. So I've taken the entire class, basically. Our biggest graduating class is like 80 students right now. Um, and I have taken them all out before. And um, what usually happens is you just break up according to chaperones. Um, so with seventh graders especially, our district policy is usually one chaperone for every 10 students. Um, and when we did the cross country skiing, that was both the seventh or that was the ninth and 10th grade, I believe. So it was a bit of a larger crew and it was pretty much, you stuck with your facilitator and you stuck with your chaperone, but it was manageable, um, just with proper planning. That's, that's really the key to it. Plan it out. Um, if that seems a bit much or you can't, you could always do all right, uh, based on if your school does homeroom or based on your ELA class or whatever, you're going to go this day and then the following day, the rest of the class goes to so do it in two separate days to make it more manageable for you. Um, but the size, I know a teacher that um, she works in a larger school district in the area and she does, um, she's one that actually told me about the grant, the New York uh, Parks the Taking Kids Outside grant. Um, she does her entire class, uh, and there's roughly probably the same size as you, um, 150, 160, 170 students per class, and she does it all, um, but she gets stu or fellow teachers to chaperone, but she also gets a lot of parent involvement as well, um, so bringing them in as well to kind of the, the home base. Usually she has the parents stay at the central area, basically guarding the food and uh, the bathrooms and uh, the teachers go out on the trails and things like that. Um, so just having that network of people there willing to help you, I think is really important for that, but definitely manageable. Uh, well, I just didn't know if you ever had done it where, okay, this trip, I'm gonna take my block two and then the next trip is gonna be my block three. Like do, do kids get, you know, kind of upset if they don't get to go like this time, you know? Yeah. I haven't really experienced that. Um, I can see where that could happen if their friends are in block A and you know they're block B, like how dare you? But um, I haven't really witnessed that. And I think just the excitement too of taking the kids outside. Um, and sometimes it's really good for them in that outdoor setting to be with a different group of people um, that might not be their friends. The freshman seminar trips that we did um, we pretty much stayed in our seminar class groups and there wasn't a lot of intermingling. So friends weren't necessarily together on that, but the amount of team building and um, amount of respect, I think shown to the facility, I think it was just incredibly helpful taking the kids out of that friendship circle that they had to be able to experience new people that at the end of the day, they didn't have to be best friends with the people that they experienced it with, but the amount of respect and just the idea like, hey, these other people are out here and we experience this together. I think that brings in a lot. Um, so there might be complaints at first, but in the end, I think the ends justify the means. Good way to say it. I brought, uh, I do some of my, some student uh, trips as well, not just teacher ones. And, and I do bring them to uh, 
down to the gorge, you know, here and there, but I, I do bring them in smaller groups, usually one class at a time, um, just for, um, even just for safety reasons in that, in that sense, uh, trying to keep it a little bit smaller, but uh, it's not, it's not impossible um, in some of those areas for sure. I do see a question in the, in the chat where it says, uh, does the Western New York region open these Adirondack trips to all master teachers? I believe no, um, but uh, I do know that other regions have been taking some workshops to the um, Adirondacks as well. I don't, I mean, I, I really can't answer that question entirely. All I do know is that when we have been running them, it's, it's wildly popular and we kind of slim down the number anyway. Uh, so I, I feel like um, it might be a, a funding thing, um, but uh, if you're ever looking for, if you're in a different master teacher uh, region and you want some, want some ideas or some. Uh... Dan and Nick, thank you so much for joining us today on Ed Trends and sharing your work. Um, and if you could please take a moment to complete the evaluation form that was placed in the chat, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. So as always, um, we, uh, we thank you for your time. And again, thank you, Nick and Stan. Health and happiness to everyone. And um, let's hope that the only good weather is ahead. Mm -hmm.